During the darkest days of the Third Reich, the most ominous sound was a knock at the door after dark. Everyone who lived under the Nazi yoke lived in fear of the secret organization that made the nighttime calls. Hitler called it his deadliest weapon. Without it, the Fuhrer's ambitions could never have been realized. As an instrument of state terror, it has hardly ever been equaled. Yet until now, its full story has not been told. The organization was called the Gestapo. The Gestapo was an organization shot through with contradictions. It appeared to be omniscient, yet its intelligent success was limited. Its public figureheads were among the most familiar household names of the Nazi party leadership. But the real architect of its success maintained a low profile. Even during the height of its terror, few would recognize the sinister genius that guided the Gestapo. And although its name has exerted a creepy fascination for more than half a century, the inner workings of the Gestapo have remained shadowy. But there is evidence. There is insider testimony from the very center of the Gestapo machine. Double agents and resistance spies add their voices to those of the regime's victims. Many are now dead, but their words recorded in diaries and journals, which are dramatized here, live on. I penetrated the Gestapo as an unpaid part-time assistant to Lieutenant Franz Buhler, Gestapo officer in charge of espionage and arrests, himself a British agent. And from then on, I had to live with the ever-present fear of being found out and subjected to the frightful tortures and death reserved for secret agents caught by the Gestapo. Gestapo. The word itself has a special resonance around the world. But how much blood, how much misery, how much sorrow, but above all, how much cruelty is bound up with it. The Gestapo has left us another witness, its own meticulous bureaucracy. In repositories abandoned by the Third Reich all over Germany, thousands of internal files detail the lives of those who fell into its agents' hands. Most of the victims did not survive, but some did, and are still alive. Milo Dorr was arrested by the Gestapo in 1942, when he was 19. He was interrogated and tortured to the point of death. All of this was recorded coolly and in objective detail in his personal file. Gestapo 4C. Gestapo 4C. Roman number 4C, due to subversive activity. My God. Is this the first time you've seen your picture? It's the first time I've seen the original. It makes me very sad to see all this. Reminds me of that terrible time. The name Gestapo summons up the full horror of the Nazi secret police, although it was only one of a network of equally ruthless state security agencies. Its image is that of a flawless, icily efficient machine. By reputation, its network of officers covered every inch of occupied Europe. Yet it was actually a small organization. In 1941, there were only 8,000 officers to oversee more than 70 million people. The archetypal Gestapo officer is a saturnine figure in a black leather trench coat. But in fact, most of the Gestapo's employees were quite ordinary, faceless bureaucrats. How then did the Gestapo exert such complete control over the actions of such a large, ever-increasing population, and perhaps more importantly, over their fears and worst imaginings? The answer to this question lies in the complex history of Hitler's governance of the Third Reich. For the Gestapo did not come into being fully fledged. Its growth was gradual, its progress dictated by the ambitions and rivalries of its early creators. Yet through all the various developments, it was driven by a single and simple aim, total social control over the civilian population. The Gestapo's roots lay in the instability of the years following the First World War. 
Germany, humiliated by the Allies, stripped of its power and forced to pay huge sums in reparations, endured anarchy and economic ruin. A rudderless government watched fascists and communists fight on the streets as the local Prussian police force failed dismally to maintain order. Into this maelstrom walked Adolf Hitler, promising order, safety and self-respect, and a new dawn for Germany. With relief, Germany accepted his offer. The Nazi party made decisive victories in the elections of January 1933, and Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of the Reich. Well, the German people's response to the uh, political agitation and street violence was one of extreme disquiet, naturally enough. Uh, they were fed up with these incessant brawls between the Nazis and their opponents, the communists, the social democrats. And I think it true to say that the German people looked towards a party or a government that would bring order to the streets. And ironically enough, of course, the party that said they could do this were the Nazis. Hitler lost no time in fortifying his position. The people had voted for security. What they got was enforcement. Hitler's ambitions required absolute power, but this was not yet within his grasp. To achieve it, he had to suppress an active array of opposing political forces. His initial tools were basic but effective, the SA, or stormtroopers. Under their thug of a leader, Ernst Röhm, the SA had been Hitler's most loyal supporters during his rise to power. In their paramilitary uniforms, the brown shirts, and with their trademark arbitrary violence, they relished the unrest that had brought Hitler into office. Hans Bernd Gisavius was a young Prussian lawyer at the time. Later, he would go on to plot from inside the Nazi regime to assassinate Hitler. Without really thinking it through, the party appointed the SA as an auxiliary police force. For 15 months, Hitler let them run things. It was only natural they should feel they were the real victors. Before long, they were leaving the real policemen behind at headquarters, and they roamed the streets alone in search of enemies of the state. The SA took possession of the streets of Germany. They adopted a zero tolerance policy, the rules of which were crystal clear. The SA's word had the force of law. Any minor infringement, like failing to salute correctly, was serious enough to result in arrest. Hitler's message was simple. In the new Germany, all opposition was futile. The policy was crude and shocking, but it worked. And its uncompromising stance was the foundation of the dictatorship to come. The Nazi party had already taken control of the newspapers. They ran repeated scare stories about the Marxist threat, uncovering alleged plots and fermenting fear of revolution among ordinary citizens. The SA took this as permission to target any organization they chose. That was an experience. It was a really significant experience for me. All of us children, we were in the Falcons' youth house. That's what we were called, the Socialist Falcons. And we were attacked on the games afternoon by the SA and the Hitler Youth. We were just children, but we were chased out, and the grown-up helpers were beaten up, wretchedly beaten up. In the evening of the 27th of February, within a month of Hitler coming to power, the Reichstag, the national parliament and symbol of democracy, was set ablaze. Amid the outrage, Hitler conveniently blamed the communists calling them a murderous plague and claiming that God had ordained that they'd be beaten down with an iron fist. Many historians have suggested that it was the SA, in a plan inspired by Hitler himself, who were the real instigators of the arson attack. Whatever the truth, this emotive event was most opportune for Hitler. It enabled him to demand a state of emergency, which was declared the following day by the ailing and spineless Reich's president, Paul von Hindenburg. Civil rights were suspended, and the German people lost their final protection from tyranny. It had taken only weeks for Hitler to achieve the crucial move that would make the Gestapo possible in that, under the state of emergency, anyone could be arrested at any time and held indefinitely without charge. 
The SA played a pivotal role, but it was too blunt an instrument for what Hitler had in mind for the future. He needed something much more refined, and in the coming months, he would discover the way to create it. In 1933, Germany had voted Hitler and the Nazi party into power and allowed all civil rights to be suspended. Hitler was working on his master plan for the Third Reich, but meanwhile, the auxiliary police, the brown-shirted SA, were in control of the streets. They made so many arrests that they ran out of jails in which to put their prisoners. At this time arose the bunkers, the terrible private jails of the SA. Taking away unfortunate victims became a customary right of the SA. The sort of violence that went on in our cities is almost beyond belief. These so-called wild camps were improvised prisons. In Oranienburg, for example, a disused brewery was commandeered. While the propaganda films showed the place as a disciplined and civilized re-education center complete with morning exercise, the truth was horribly different. 900 people were crammed in here at the mercy of the SA, who tortured and killed them with a completely free hand. Everyone had their turn, of course. The Red Front, the Social Democrats, anyone who wasn't a fascist, and the Jews. The SA's anti-Semitic campaign had gained momentum steadily since Hitler's takeover. Joseph Goebbels, his propaganda minister, legitimized it by announcing punitive measures against all Jewish businesses in Germany. Heute Morgen um 10 Uhr hat der Bagat begonnen. Er wird bis um die Mitternachtstunde fortgesetzt. Er vollzieht sich mit einer schlagartigen Wucht, aber auch mit einer imponierenden Mannessucht. The SA needed no further encouragement. Their behavior became even more outrageous. And it was the Jews who bore the brunt of their violence and intimidation. Even Hitler supporters were shocked, and abroad there was widespread moral outrage. So Hitler reigned the SA in. They had played their part. The civilian police force returned to the streets of Berlin. The Führer was working on a more ambitious plan. He had seen the stormtroopers' effectiveness in demolishing opposition, but he was also aware of their decadent self-indulgence, their corrupt leadership, and their lack of discipline. This was not the image of fascism he wanted to project to the world. He knew exactly what he did want, something that could take the nervous anxiety created by the SA and refine it, a secret political police force to serve the Führer, Party, and Reich. He called it the Geheime Staatspolizei, the secret state police. But it would come to be known by its abbreviation, a word that became synonymous with fear, the Gestapo. Hitler already had security and surveillance units in place as a matter of standard policy. But the Gestapo was to be something different. It was to be a secret, but a very well-known secret. The new force established its headquarters in Prince Albrechtstrasse in Berlin. At first, it had jurisdiction only in the large Eastern German province of Prussia, and there were just 200 officers, all highly educated careerists. To lead them, Hitler chose Hermann Goering, who was among the most ambitious and vainglorious of his inner circle. Goering guarded his executive power over the police force in Prussia very closely. The Gestapo was his pampered child, and he knew only too well that it held the key to his power. The Führer enjoyed reading his spicy and highly dramatized secret reports. Goering's brief was direct, to root out opposition wherever it lay. But the Nazis' chief enemies, communists, social democrats, trade unionists, and clergy, had by then gone underground. Finding them would require the skill of highly trained men. Goering made sure the new force realized that theirs was a different sort of police work and that they were not employed to pursue common criminals. But Goering soon encountered competition from Heinrich Himmler, 
and Reinhard Heydrich, two rising stars in the Nazi hierarchy who were casting covetous eyes over the new organization. Himmler had been at Hitler's side since the early days in Munich, capital of Bavaria, where the Nazi movement had been born a decade previously. There he led the SS, Hitler's personal security service. Under his authority, the SS had expanded, extending its reach over the entire Bavarian state police force. Unsurprisingly, Himmler was taking a close interest in the development of the Gestapo, as was his fellow SS leader, Reinhard Heydrich, a clever and ambitious young Nazi officer. Heydrich was the hidden pivot around which the Nazi regime revolved. The development of a whole nation was guided by his forceful character. Heydrich was, in fact, the puppet master of the Third Reich. Himmler and Heydrich had recruited a third person for their team, a trained professional they trusted implicitly, an experienced, dedicated policeman, Heinrich Müller, who was destined to have a profound influence on the future of the Gestapo. Müller joined the Munich political police as his first job, and he made a name for himself as a very effective uh, surveyor of the communists. He, in many respects, fitted the mold. He was ambitious, he was ruthless, he was committed, he was obedient, and although he wasn't a Nazi before 1933, Heydrich and Himmler were very clear that this is the sort of person whose experience they needed. Müller was unlike his immediate bosses. He wasn't vain and rejected the trappings of power in favor of total focused professionalism. Any form of conversation with him was almost impossible. It consisted on his part almost entirely of coldly phrased questions and was largely an interrogation. He once said to me, one really ought to drive all the intellectuals into a coal mine, then blow it up. Even as the fledgling Gestapo was establishing itself in Berlin, the SS Triumvirate in Munich embarked on a new scheme that was breathtakingly despotic. Building on the idea of the bunkers, they were setting up a camp near Munich in a suburb called Dachau. Here, the SS planned to concentrate all those persons deemed arbitrarily to be enemies of the Nazi state. By the summer of 1933, the scheme had taken off in style. 26,000 people of left-wing views, trades unionists and intellectuals, artists and priests had been interned in camps across Germany several thousand of them in Dachau. Anna Prohl was a member of a resistance group. Several of her friends were arrested for their political activities in 1933 and taken to Dachau. The communist, Leonard Hausmann, was in the workers' home. I told him about the posters on the billboards that Hitler is now Chancellor of the Reich. He then packed a few things and left his office. He didn't run away, he simply left the office. And when they arrested him, that was in March 33, they took him to Dachau, where he was shot on the 17th of May. Presented to the outside world through the international press, Dachau was described as a rest camp. The truth soon became obvious. Von Dachau hörte ich dann, we heard that Dachau was not a re-education camp, as they had always told us. You went in without any trial and didn't know how long you'd stay or whether you'd ever come out alive. And we heard that people were tortured there and beaten and you could also die there. The inmates of the concentration camps were officially held in what was called 
protective custody. Protective custody in the Third Reich meant a knock on the door at three or four o'clock in the morning by the Gestapo, being bundled off without packing any supplies or clothes, without even saying goodbye to one's loved ones, and being taken to a concentration camp, where immediately there would be a process almost of dehumanization. I was taken into protective custody. They protected society from us, as it were, the other way round. And they didn't need any proof or anything. They could send you to a camp, an extermination camp, without anything. They didn't need anything to do it. In the concentration camps, the SS had created the ultimate containment and punishment for all dissenters. In Berlin, the Gestapo was setting up a super-efficient machine for detecting them. For the power-hungry Himmler and Heydrich, the enticing prospect of gaining control over both organizations was proving irresistible. The relationship between Hitler's henchmen in the newly created Nazi Germany was that of a constant power struggle on perpetually shifting ground. Hitler's technique for controlling his deputies was to encourage rivalry between them, thus fanning their insecurities by shifting favorites. The result was a combustible mixture of paranoia, plot and counterplot. Gradually, Himmler mounted his challenge to take over the Gestapo. He had already taken control of local political police forces throughout the country, and the SD, the intelligence branch of the SS he formed in 1932, which was now ruled by Heydrich, and dedicated to rooting out traitors in the Nazi ranks, had raised its profile and increased its activities. Early in 1934, Himmler boarded a train to Berlin with his underlings, Heydrich and Müller. Hitler, impressed both by Himmler's concentration camps and his political skills, abandoned Goering and switched his favor to his dear Heinrich. He decreed that all Germany's police services spearheaded by the Gestapo should be unified under Himmler's personal control. Hitler transferred the Gestapo officially from Goering to Himmler in Berlin. Heydrich became head of the Gestapo office, with the highly efficient Müller as his deputy. Goering wasn't cast out completely. Within months, he was appointed head of the newly constructed Nazi Air Force. From that moment on, Germany's entire political police force was controlled from Berlin. On paper, the Gestapo remained a local force, but in reality, all German regional secret police forces obeyed Gestapo authority. The structure of the security forces, never straightforward, remained fluid and slippery. The SS under Himmler retained an overarching role responsible for numerous departments, including administration, finance, foreign intelligence, the regular criminal police, and the SD. Muller took over the running of the Gestapo. It was the perfect job for him, as his zeal was equaled only by his obsession with efficiency. Soon he had things running in the smooth way he wanted. The Gestapo brief was clear and unambiguous. It was to be the agency that cleansed Germany of all political, social, racial, and cultural impurity. If its methods came into conflict with existing statutes, the Gestapo's decision would be upheld. Each person who passed through Gestapo hands was photographed, fingerprinted, and given a file card with personal details, recorded along with the supposed crime, details of the interrogation, and the action taken as a result. These card indexes form the basis of the Gestapo's power. Have a look. In this box is this index, and look right here, under L. You must be in this box. Let's go to the table and see if your file is really in here. In the Vienna archives, 50,000 original dossiers hold the details of communists, trade unionists and churchmen, all potential members of opposition groups in the area. Among them was Hans Landau. So, here's your card, look. Here's your name, single, birthplace, a physical description, 180 tall, pale, thin, and here. You see, these numbers refer to other documents that the Gestapo have on you. Here's your personal Gestapo file, where the actual documents were, and your charge sheet. 
The files resemble those of any large bureaucratic organization. The language is formal, and there are boxes for each item of information. The official appearance of the documents attempts to legitimize the despicable actions they so conscientiously record. We were completely open to them. They could do what they wanted with us. No justice, no law or anything. It was an institution that paid no heed to anything. The new security supremos appeared in public frequently, with the exception of Müller, who persistently stayed out of sight. They gave the impression of total self-confidence, but in reality the problems were not quite over. There still existed a serious threat to their ambitions. Despite removal from the streets, the brown-shirted SA, the stormtroopers, had not gone away. And neither had their leader, Ernst Röhm. He was a member of the, the old school, old fighter Nazi generation, if you like. His contribution was crucial to the Nazi seizure of power. But once the Nazis had seized power, there was a problem. What did one do with the SA? Following the wild rampages of 1933, the SA were muzzled by Hitler. But Rome was still determined to strike out and complete his own German revolution. In Rome's eyes, the Nazi party owed its entire success to his brown shirts, and they deserved to have control over police and military as their reward. The situation was complicated by the fact that Röhm was one of the very few men who were on familiar personal terms with Hitler. He was the Führer's chief of staff, and in public at least, Hitler supported Röhm in his aspirations. Eine große Zeit ist angebrochen. Und wir sind nur ihre lebenden Zeugen, sondern ihre Gestalter. Rome was convinced he could transform his undisciplined squadrons into cadres for the army of the future. His idea was simple and logical. The sooner he took advantage of the first upsurge after the seizure of power to hack through the jungle of laws and the mazes of foreign policy, the sooner his revolutionary army would become the German army of the future. Rome was becoming a problem. Hitler, adopting his usual technique of divide and rule, set up his other henchmen to topple the troublesome Ernst Rome. The beer hall rowdies of the SA were beyond the pale. They represented the most extreme, violent, and fanatical elements of the Nazi movement in those days. Rome's activities in setting up a private militia may have constituted a threat to the state, but this was only a pretext. In the ambitious Himmler and the still more ambitious Heydrich, Hitler had willing executioners, each of whom seized the opportunity to build up his own power. On the 27th of June, 1934, at a covert meeting in Prince Albrechtstrasse, Heydrich announced that intelligence confirms that the SA under Rome is planning a coup. This was a deliberate lie. Heydrich and Müller coordinated a so-called counter-operation from Gestapo HQ. Heydrich prepared a list, signed off by Hitler, of those who were to be shot. Within days, the newsreels were trumpeting their success. Ninety internal opponents, including Ernst Röhm, had been liquidated in the purge, which became known as the Night of the Long Knives. The police paraded in triumph before Hitler, who saluted them from the window of his office. Vorbeimarsch, eine Abteilung der Landespolizeigruppe General Göring an der Reichskanzlei am Tage der Aburteilung der Hochverräter. The SA had been obliterated. With that threat removed, Himmler's security services had gained unbounded power. 
the Gestapo was ready to move forward. Nothing and nobody could stop it. After the assassination of Ernst Röhm, Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich and Müller were in complete control of Germany's security. The country's political police forces under the orders of the Gestapo were already well on their way to suppressing all opposition. Müller had made a study of the notorious Soviet secret police. Under his direction, the Gestapo began to establish its own trademark methods. These were all designed to spread suspicion and anxiety. Johann Schwert was part of what little opposition remained. He printed and distributed anti-Nazi leaflets and raised funds for the Republican cause in Spain. I'd hardly got into the flat when two armed men appeared outside the door. I was taken directly from the flat to prison, police prison. They knew so much about me because they'd already interrogated people. That's when they began to hit me in the face. I was beaten up in the first hour. It's a terrible thing when you don't know when you're hauled from your cell what's going to happen to you. I had a thick sweater on when I was arrested. I kept it on day and night as protection. Because I knew that whenever I was taken below, I'd be beaten. It went on for days, day and night, day and night. Johann Schwert passed through 14 prisons before his eventual release in 1945, 10 years later. Five of those years were spent in solitary confinement, interrupted only by Gestapo interrogations. Yet Schwert is one of the lucky ones. Few of the Gestapo's victims survived. In the propaganda, however, Gestapo officers were shown as guardians of the people, there to serve. Posters portrayed the Gestapo as friend and helper, protecting society from the dark forces that threatened it. They even featured as benign characters in comics and children's games. It was all part of Muller's carefully conceived strategy designed to create a specific image of the Gestapo in the public mind. That image was of an all-powerful body able to destroy its enemies at will. The classic Gestapo knock on the door, sudden, swift and anonymous underlined the illusion of total control. To reinforce this fiction, Muller encouraged the belief that the Gestapo was everywhere. Propaganda stories were also planted in the newspapers to strike fear into potential opponents. The reports described a constant stream of arrests. In effect, they were lengthy advertisements for Gestapo power. We talked about how the Gestapo watched people and ensured that no one said anything bad about the regime. The great strength of the Gestapo was the um, publicity, or more, more specifically the propaganda uh, surrounding it, the myths surrounding it, that the Gestapo were here, there and everywhere. Um, so that uh, any German, when making a comment that was going to be mildly even adverse to the regime, would look over his shoulder. And it was known as the German look, the Deutsche Blick. In fact, the Gestapo's knowledge was less comprehensive than its carefully crafted image of omniscience implied. But the accumulation of information was nevertheless much greater than could be expected of such a small group of officers. How was this achieved? The answer lies in these files. Meticulously maintained, they record millions of pieces of personal information. And most of the information was given to the Gestapo by informers. It was the German people who did much of the Gestapo's work. The officers were employed largely to analyze and collate the data that was brought in. So, what is going on with you? Oh, 
I said, what's up with you? A tailor about 50 years old. My daughter has denounced me and my wife. She wanted to marry an SS man, and the parents didn't want her to. So she went to the Gestapo, and the parents were arrested. It wasn't only personal issues that got reported. There were a lot of people that were quite happy to inform on their neighbours if they were making adverse comments about the Hitler regime. Some people informed in the sincere belief that Germany's future was more important than the fate of individuals. Others did it out of envy or revenge, still more informed to save themselves or their families from the knock on the door. For it was known that Gestapo's suspicion led to the concentration camps. An officer's word was all that was required. And it soon became common knowledge that the Gestapo equated mercy with weakness and regarded weakness as fatal to the regime. It was terrible to be arrested. It meant death. We were always hearing, so-and-so has disappeared. Officially, you weren't permitted to talk about it. But amongst ourselves, we did. And we knew just what it meant. There was a terrible feeling of being defenseless and humiliated. Inhumanity. Inhumanity. How can such, such an idiot get into the position of torturing another human being? It was a threat. It was really the epitome of what the Nazi regime was. You could say you felt it like the fist of the Nazis. Over time, the Gestapo's reputation became rooted in the fabric of society and opposition was almost completely eradicated. By the late 1930s, the Gestapo had purged Germany of all visible resistance. This was the moment when its leaders felt ready to fulfill the nation's true destiny and shape the future of the Thousand-Year Reich. Heydrich put the Gestapo's new task into words. The police of the National Socialist State will now above all fulfill the task of rebuilding the people's society from the ground up, according to the precepts of the political leadership. The Nazi ideal was the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's society. This society was to be based on equality, unity and social harmony. But it was only for those who qualified. Membership demanded absolute conformity. The Gestapo's task was to draw up lists of those whose actions made them unfit for the society of the master race. Crimes that warranted inclusion on the lists were many and varied. The Gestapo was not expected to round up those names on the lists. There were simply too many of them and the task was delegated to local police forces. One major group targeted by the lists was the Jews. Soon, the discrimination against the entire race was made legal. On the 15th of September, 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were enacted and published. Discrimination against the Jews, henceforth, had an official basis, the racial laws. They were very popular. You weren't allowed to mix with Jews. I even saw how someone was brought out, a woman, who had had a Jewish boyfriend. And she had to wear a sign saying, I'm a great swine, I go with Jews. A new kind of pseudoscience entered the curriculum. I was a so-called first-degree half-breed, and Hitler hated them especially, because the Nuremberg laws said I couldn't marry one of those so-called Aryans, but I could marry another half-breed, because the resulting offspring would be a cretin, and the child could then be murdered straight away. That's what we were told, and I just sat there and thought, this can't be happening. 
The teacher said something like, I've remembered it my whole life. He said, in this school year, we're going to look at racial studies. And I can tell you right now that Löwenberg belongs to an inferior race. That's all that he said. And I went home bawling my eyes out. Das war alles, was er gesagt hat. Und ich bin dann heulend nach Hause gegangen. The Nazi hierarchy worried not an iota about the effect of their legislation on children. They were more concerned with increasing their own power base. Himmler was now so popular with Hitler that he was appointed head of all the German police, which meant effectively that the police force became an arm of the Gestapo power, not the other way around. The Gestapo's tentacles were creeping further around the heart of German society. So effective were the Gestapo officers in carrying out their domestic duties that by the end of the 30s, they were ready and poised to spread their influence even further. And Hitler had a fresh role for them. He intended to expand the Third Reich, and the newly conquered territories would need to be pacified. He assigned the Gestapo the task of dismantling resistance abroad. Heydrich prepared the plans. The Gestapo was assigned to accompany the armed forces of the Wehrmacht on their first moves abroad into the territory of Germany's friendliest neighbors. Muller told his most trusted officers to draw up secret lists of all the individuals likely to cause trouble. They would be arrested and removed as soon as the military movement began. Austria, in March 1938, was the first country to be annexed. While the crowd celebrated, the Gestapo was already at work. All I know is, on the first night, they arrested the former authorities from between 1934 and 38, and everyone on the left, communists, social democrats, and liberals alike. A few months later, the Nazi army marched unopposed into the Sudetenland, the German-speaking area of Czechoslovakia. Like Austria, it was seen as home territory, despite being a part of a sovereign nation, and its annexation was largely uneventful. Here too, the Gestapo arrived with its lists at the ready. The nocturnal knocks at the door commenced, and people began to disappear. Then on to Prague. The Sudetenland having fallen, it was an easy matter to take the Czech capital as well. Hitler had expanded the Reich virtually unopposed. And while the Gestapo cleansed the new territories of every hint of opposition, his popularity in Germany rose to an all-time high. In Berlin, there was little hope or expectation that Hitler would halt his aggression in Prague. Goebbels' propaganda machine began to hint at war with Western Europe. And at Gestapo HQ, the plans had already been laid. Heydrich Müller and a small band of trusted Gestapo officers were preparing Operation Tannenberg. It was a ruthless, brutal scheme, deliberately intended to deceive both the German public and the world at large. The Gestapo had been entrusted with masterminding a plan that was to throw Europe, and ultimately the whole world, into war. Its power had grown immense. By the start of the war, the Gestapo is at the center of a huge terror apparatus which has arms stretching into every part of German society. It had effectively crushed the left. It was well on the way to enacting its vision of a German people's community in which internal aliens would be eradicated. And it was perfectly placed to police German society once war broke out. It was a historic moment. Muller and his Gestapo were poised to add millions more names to their lists of ruined lives. And they were more than ready for the challenges that lay ahead. 